let's see if we're going. Looks like we're showing up on the YouTube, so that's good. The microphone is working. All right, hello and welcome to another live stream. This week we are talking about erectile dysfunction. This is something that people were asking about last week, so I thought I'd say a few things about it. Most of it's gonna come from this book, Principles of Chinese Medical Andrology. Principles of Chinese Medical Andrology by uh, Bob Demone. So this is from uh, Blue Poppy Press. You might be able to get it on Amazon, but you can also go to the Blue Poppy website and get it if you um, if you want to know more about uh, men's health issues. And, and so this is kind of a cool book because uh, I feel like there are not a lot of books specifically about men's health or male reproductive and urological health. There's just, it's like, um, Machiocha has a really thick book on women's health, on gynecology and obstetrics, which I mean makes sense because this is that's a very large uh, topic in TCM. But um, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of books specifically about men's health. So this is kind of a cool book written by uh, uh, Bob Demone from who was the uh, dean at Pacific College for a while. And so this is kind of this is kind of a neat book. It's kind of um, it's like it has a textbook like feel to it. It's kind of like a, a, a manual, a user's manual. So it's kind of like the, the Machiocha Gold book where he uh, takes different disease names, breaks down the etiology in terms of TCM, breaks down the different patterns that could go along with that disease, and then uh, talks about the pattern differentiation and things like that. So it's maybe not like an interesting book to just like sit down and if you want to relax in the bathtub and read a nice book, it's maybe not for that, but it's, it is a really good like textbook, like user manual about men's health issues. So let's see who's here. We got a lot of our regulars here. Hi. Vijay. Hi. So thanks for being here on the weekend. Um, let me know if this is a topic that you're interested in, erectile dysfunction because a lot of people were asking about last week. So I thought I'd just say a few things. I actually don't want to go into too much detail because I've been having this issue on YouTube that apparently there's a lot of people that just, um, like, uh, it's, it's surprising that there's a lot of people who, like, buy their own needles and just start sticking needles in themselves. And that's really weird to me. Or even when I make videos about herbs, I'll m make a video about Tian Wang Guxin Dan, and it's supposed to be a review video for people who are in school. But then people who have never studied Chinese medicine watch this video, and they're like, "Can I take this for atrial fibrillation?" It's like, "No, go go see an acupuncturist. If you're not studying acupuncture, go see an acupuncturist." So I don't want to say I don't actually want to go into too much detail because I don't want people to be like, oh, I have this problem, I'm going to take this formula, or I have this problem, I'm going to start stabbing myself in these points. And really, that's um, if you're not an acupuncturist, go see an acupuncturist and get, and get your herbs prescribed from someone who's qualified to diagnose you. If you are an acupuncturist, then hopefully when I say liver tea stagnation, you kind of know what that means and you know what kind of formulas and points you would use to treat liver tea stagnation. Omar's here. Hey, Omar. Hi, 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 hi. Um, so let's talk about that. We're to, uh, again, if you're just joining us, we're talking about erectile dysfunction because people were asking about this last week. And I think the main thing I want to say about this in this conversation is I feel like it's really common that when people see erectile dysfunction, they automatically want to diagnose kidney yang deficiency that uh, it doesn't matter what the patient, it doesn't matter what's going on, they just make this one-to-one -one correlation of erectile dysfunction, means kidney yang deficiency, I better give them uh, yang tonics, we better go with the Korean red ginseng to warm the Ming Men fire, we need to give them horny goat weed to uh, tonify their kidney yang, and that's what's going to help their erectile dysfunction. And like with a lot of things, with most of our diseases in TCM, it's we have both excess and deficiency possibilities in terms of our patterns. And so we have to remember that, that this also applies to erectile dysfunction, that yes, we can have deficiency conditions like kidney yang deficiency causing erectile dysfunction, but we can also have excess conditions. And actually these excess conditions might be more common than what you think. 
And so basically we kind of have to differentiate this. Is it really like a kidney yang deficiency or some other type of deficiency? Or is it more likely liver chi stagnation or some sort of stagnation in the liver channel that's blocking the free flow? And so I think this is something to keep in mind, especially if you're dealing with a younger patient. I've had a lot of people come in in their like 20s and 30s with erectile dysfunction and people want to give them kidney yang tonics. And it's just like a man in his 20s, it's very unlikely that he would be suffering from kidney yang deficiency. It's probably much more likely to be some sort of liver stagnation. And so we'll talk about how to differentiate those. Uh, yeah, we're saying we want to cut out the middleman, which I can, I can kind of agree with that. Um, I, I just worry that there's this idea that Chinese medicine, they say, oh, it's natural. That means we can do whatever we want and there's no side effects. It's not going to harm people. And that's not, I think, especially with herbs, I think, oh, I can get this herbal supplement on Amazon. That just means it's natural and I can take it and there will be no side effects. And that's not actually the case. If you're going to take herbs, go see an herbalist. And um, Chinese herbs can be very strong, very powerful. So make sure you're getting them prescribed, that you're not just taking something that you saw on a YouTube video. So what should we say about erectile dysfunction? So first of all, um, this is again coming from Bob DeMone's book. He lists the, the different disease names in Chinese about how we, we refer to erectile dysfunction, or this is uh, kind of the closest disease classically that corresponds to our modern concept of erectile dysfunction. So the most common one I see is yang wilt or yang wei. Wei means wilt or atrophy. And so we call it yang wilt because uh, it's a male problem. Uh, the process of getting an erection is a yang process and male sexuality is a yang thing. So that's why they call it yang wilt. Interestingly, some people also refer to it as yin wilt, which seems kind of like the opposite. But here I think what they're referring to is uh, yin as in the lower body. And so sometimes we refer to like the urethra and the anus as the lower yin orifices or the anterior and posterior yin. So sometimes people make this jokes like, oh, you just pulled that out of your posterior yin orifice. And they're referring to the anus. Uh, and so I think here the anterior yin can refer to the urethra, or in this case, the penis. So when you say yin wilt, that's what we're talking about. I think this one is good, sinew wilt, jin wei. Uh, basically the idea here is there are some classical references where the penis is referred to the, as the ancestral sinew. So you have atrophy of your ancestral sinew. So that's why they call it uh, sinew uh, sinew uh, wilt. So that's kind of the basic idea about, um, those are kind of the, some of the names of for erectile dysfunction. So how do we approach this? Well, I think that whenever you have somebody coming in with a complaint or a disease, the first thing you want to ask is like, what does that mean to you? That you need to get some details, you need to get some background story. So a lot of times people come in and say, I have hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, and you need to know what does that mean to you? What do your specific symptoms look like? How do you know you have hypothyroidism? Or if somebody comes in and says, I have insomnia, you need to know what does that mean to you? Does it mean you can't fall asleep? You can't stay asleep? That you wake up early in the morning? You get eight hours of sleep, but you don't wake feeling refreshed? You toss and turn a lot? What do you mean by you have insomnia? And so this is kind of important because sometimes what the patient is saying might be different than what you think they mean. It's kind of like I've had patients come in and they say, oh, I have constipation. And to me, when I hear constipation, I think infrequent bowel movements with hard, dry stool. And really, when I ask them, what do you mean by constipation? They're still going once or twice a day. It's just that it's difficult and it doesn't feel complete. And so that's what they mean by constipation. So we have to um, kind of get an idea of if somebody comes in and says, I have erectile dysfunction, what does that mean to you? Does that mean um, it's completely... Sorry, Omar, I'm, I need to stop you. I need to, um, you can't just uh, do the chat, uh, spam the chat like that. Um, so if somebody comes in and says, I have uh, erectile dysfunction, we need to know, like, what does that actually mean? Does that mean that they can never get an erection? Or does it just mean uh, the erection is not as hard as they want it to be? 
Does it mean that they might start off getting an erection, and but it fades quickly before they want it to? Does it mean that... Um, does it only happen with, when they're with a partner? So we kind of want this background information to know exactly what we're dealing with. And so one of the key, the key things we want to ask about this is basically when does the erectile dysfunction occur? Is it all the time? Is it that no matter what, you can never get an erection? Or is it just something that occurs only with your partner? And so this is kind of, we can differ, use this to differentiate. Are we dealing with a physical problem? There's a lack of blood flow to the penis, so you just never... You can never get an erection, you never in the morning, never during the night, never when you're alone. Uh, you can never get an erection, probably more of a physical problem with blood flow. Whereas um, if it's something that it only happens when you're with a partner, then we can say it's more of a mental emotional issue, that there might be some stress or some sort of mental emotional issue involved that uh, erection can't occur when you're with a partner. So that's kind of a key differentiation to ask. And sometimes you can just, just like ask, uh, I think in what in Western medicine they ask like, do you have erections in the morning? Really common to get morning wood or spontaneous erections during the night. Sometimes they'll even do a sleep study to see like, are you getting spontaneous erections while you're asleep? If that's true, then that means there's not a physical problem. There's not a physical problem of blood getting to the penis. Um, whereas if it only happens in the partner, more likely to be a mental emotional thing. And so I think we can kind of translate this into uh, TCM, where when it's that situation where the erectile dysfunction only occurs when you're with a partner, then we can say it's more of a stress thing. It's more there's probably some liver chi stagnation involved, and we don't necessarily need to give these um, yang tonics. We might just need to course liver chi. So that's, so that's something we should remember. So I don't know. Let's just go through the patterns. So again, we want to we want to differentiate between excess conditions and deficiency conditions. That we can't just say, "Oh, this person has erectile dysfunction. Let's give them kidney yang tonics. Let's give them yohimbe bark. Let's give them uh, horny goat, re goat weed to tonify kidney yang." We have to keep in mind there are so there are also possible excess conditions as well. And just take a look that most of these excess conditions involve the liver channel. So remember, the liver channel goes up the leg, it goes to the inguinal crease, it encircles the genitals, and then uh, goes up the chest. So that's why we could say a lot of this has to do with the liver channel, because the liver channel goes to the genitals. So we have these different patterns. Uh, binding depression of liver chi. This is like a Nigel Weissman term for liver chi stagnation. So the idea is um, liver chi is stagnant, so there's not enough chi and blood flowing to the penis. But again, that's just because the liver channel encircles the genitals. So this is, would be the most common one where if you have a person that when they're alone, they have no problem with erectile dysfunction. If they're watching pornography or masturbating, no problem with erectile dysfunction. But then when they get to, with their partner, the, there's like a lot of stress involved, and uh, then they have issues with erectile dysfunction. This, this might be the more likely pattern. And so, and then again, this is something we want to pay attention to. Like um, this one time, this one time uh, we took this trip to Chinatown and uh, in, the, in this herb shop in Chinatown, they, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted. This one time in, Ch in Chinatown we went and um, they had a, a three penis wine, San Biengio. And I thought it was, I thought it was kind of funny. Uh, it came in a really pretty bottle. It looked like a gourd. I, th I thought, oh, I'm just going to get this to try this. And so I, I bought this bottle of three penis wine. And it came in a pretty box, too. And uh, it was kind of funny because they, they put it in a bag, like one of those plastic grocery bags. But the grocery bag was kind of see-through. And so on the box, it didn't say, like, it didn't really say three penis wine in, in English. It said San Bienju and, and Pinyin really small, but it had very large Chinese characters on it. So my Chinese teacher was like, no, you have to turn it around. Everybody can see that you're walking around with three penis wine. They're going to make judgments about you. So I thought that was kind of funny. But anyway, there was another student there. And I said, oh, yeah, I got this three penis wine. And she was like, oh, yeah, maybe I should get some of that for my boyfriend because he has some, some problems with erectile dysfunction. And I was kind of like, well, how old is this boyfriend? And he's like, oh, he's 26. And it's like, 
if he's 26 years old, it's probably very unlikely that he has kidney yang deficiency and he would need something like three penis wine to warm his Ming Men fire. If he's 26, more likely it's like liver chi stagnation causing erectile dysfunction. And she was kind of like, oh yeah, he is like his work is really stressful, his job is really stressful, and that's a contributing factor. So for something like in that case, probably want to do more coursing of liver chi rather than tonifying kidney yang. So that's um, something we want to look at. So that's our, our first one, binding depression of liver chi. This is basically just liver chi stagnation. This could be emotional things. This could be stress. Um, I don't want to say too much about like gender roles, but sometimes in classical Chinese, gender roles come up a lot. And so there's kind of this like stereotype of men don't express their emotions very well, especially with anger and frustration, they tend to hold it in. And so that um, having unexpressed emotions can lead to liver chi stagnation. Once this liver chi stagnates, it can cause other systemic problems, including erectile dysfunction. So that's another, that would be a common etiology here is unexpressed uh, emotions cause binding depression of liver chi, which can then lead to erectile dysfunction. So that's, that's like a main one we wanna look at. And so in terms of formulas, uh, basically in here, he uses our uh, basic uh, liver chi moving formula, chai hu shu gan san, and there are some modifications you can do, but basically uh, formulas to move liver chi are, is what's gonna help there. Liver channel damp heat. So here the idea is we have a damp heat pathogen pouring into the lower jowl and again obstructing the liver channel. So chi and blood can't get to the can't get to the lower jowl, can't get to the penis, and so that's causing erectile dysfunction. So with liver channel damp heat, basically we're going to see our classic signs of damp heat, like a, a rapid, slippery, wiry pulse, a red tongue with yellow coating indicating damp heat. Usually, a lot of times our etiology of damp heat has to do with uh, diet. So this might be someone who eats a lot of spicy foods and drinks a lot of alcohol. That forms damp heat. That damp heat pours into the lower jowl and obstructs the flow of chi and blood to the penis. And that's what's causing our erectile dysfunction. And it's kind of funny. Usually when we say uh, uh, lower jowl damp heat or liver, liver channel damp heat, a lot of times we diagnose this in women if it's like a yeast infection or uh, itchy genitals. And so it turns out we have the same kind of symptoms with men that uh, I think Bob DeMone mentions like a, a malodorous, itchy, damp scrotum. And so I think that would be kind of funny that you ask your patient, it's like, how's your scrotum smell? Is it damp and itchy down there? And that would be another sign of a uh, liver channel damp heat or damp heat pouring into the lower jowl. So again, for uh, liver channel damp heat, our formula is long dan xie gan tang, drain the drain damp heat from the liver. So that's what we would do for that one. Cold stagnation in the liver. Here we're, we're still talking about stagnation in the liver, but here we have a cold evil stagnating. I should probably like not gesture to my crotch as I do this, but we have a cold evil stagnating in the liver channel, obstructing the flow of qi and blood to the penis, and so. This is kind of an interesting one because normally when we talk about cold stagnation in the liver channel, we associate that with Shan disorder or hernia pain or mounting disorder or bulging disorder, that there's a cold pathogen obstructing the liver channel causing pain. And so we're going to see similar types of symptoms there with like pulling pain on the testicles or groin pain or hernia type pain. But here it can also, that cold stagnation can cause a lack of flow of qi and blood to the, uh, to the penis and cause erectile dysfunction. And so there our formula is, I think the, the literal name of the formula is warm the liver decoction, nuan gan, nuan gan yin. Um, and so it's, it's warm the liver decoction. And so, and so that's kind of a funny one when we talk about, uh, when we talk about in formula, formula class, formula review, that's usually a formula for Shan disorder or hernia pain. And it's kind of a funny pattern because normally you talk about the liver, the liver tends to be hot. The liver is, is a very yang, tends to be more yang. We talk about liver heat, liver fire, or liver yang rising. It's very unusual to diagnose a cold liver. So generally when we say cold in the liver, what we actually mean is cold in the liver channel. 
Just remember that the liver channel goes to the inguinal crease, it encircles the genitals. So when we have cold in the liver channel, we can get things like hernia pain, or in this case, erectile dysfunction. So when we say cold in the liver, we actually mean cold in the liver channel. So that's another possibility. Blood stasis. Again, this is kind of like just because blood is stagnant, there's not enough blood flowing to the penis, uh, causing erectile dysfunction. So again, if with this we would see like our classic signs of blood stasis, which is basically the person is purple. They have a dark, sooty, ashen complexion. They might have uh, purple or purple lips, a purple tongue, a rough, choppy pulse, all these signs of blood stagnation. Uh, I think, I think uh, Bob Damone says this usually occurs with people who have had surgery or had some sort of uh, physical trauma causing blood, sta uh, blood stasis or blood stagnation. And it's kind of interesting here, his, the formula he uses is Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong, which I think is interesting. Normally when we talk about Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong, we talk about blood stagnation in the chest. Um, I actually like to use Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong for uh, lower jowl blood stagnation as well, usually in women with uh, menstruation issues, uh, especially if it's blood stagnation but not necessarily due to cold. Then I, I like that formula, so I just thought it was interesting that he is also using it for blood stagnation in the lower jowl. Just now we're talking about blood stagnation causing erectile dysfunction. So those are our excess patterns. And basically kind of the common theme here is even though we have all these different patterns, the kind of the commonality between them is they all have something to do with the liver channel. Because again, liver channel encircles the genitals. Um, And so we can kind of, it's kind of like with these excess conditions, we could diagnose, we, we, I guess it's like our first step is we could just say there's some sort of stagnation, there's something going on in the liver channel that's stagnating, that's not allowing the flow of chi and blood to the penis. Then we can think about what's causing that stagnation. Is it chi stagnation? Is it cold stagnation? Is it uh, damp heat blocking the flow? Is it blood stasis? So all these, there's, there's just some sort of stagnation in the liver channel. We want to know what's the cause of it. Um, yeah, so we're asking why not Xiao Fu Ju Yu Tong for the lower region instead of Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong? And that, that's a good question. So Xiao Fu Ju Yu Tong, Xiao Fu means lesser abdomen. So this is one for specifically for blood stagnation in the lower abdomen. But just remember that Xiao Fu Ju Yu Tong contains a lot of warming herbs like, um, I can't remember if it's food or rogue wei or both, but it contains warming herbs like rogue wei, like ganjiang, like xiao hui xiang. So this is specifically for blood stagnation due to excess cold. And so when you see, when you use Xiao Fu Ju Yu Tong, you, need, you should probably see signs of coldness in order to use that formula. Uh, Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong I like because Shui Fu means the mansion of blood and when Wang Ching Ren wrote about this, the mansion of blood, he was talking more about the chest. I have had Chinese people say that, um, Chinese teachers tell me that the mansion of blood can also refer to the uterus and so they, so even they will use it for um, issues with menstruation. I really like the formula Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong because it's easy to modify, it's easy to adjust um, the focus of the formula. Because Shui Fu Ju Yu Tong is a combination of Tao Hong Su Wu Tong, our basic blood invigorating formula, plus Si Ni San, our basic Qi invigorating formula. So, um, so basically we can kind of very easily modify this formula. That if we want to deal more with blood stagnation, we can emphasize the blood invigorating herbs. If we want to deal more with chi stagnation, we can emphasize the chi moving herbs. If we want to, and it's also based on suwutong, so we can even, if we have blood deficiency, we can increase the dosage of the blood tonifying herbs as well. So we kind of have this very versatile formula that especially as a woman goes through the different parts of her cycle, at some parts of the cycle we could emphasize blood tonification, and then as we move to later in the cycle we can emphasize either blood invigorating or chi, the chi moving aspects. And I think this is really common with um, stagnation, uh, 
like PMS type uh, symptoms, that tends to be a combination of both blood stagnation and liver T stagnation. So if you have sharp stabbing pain in the lower abdomen, that would be more like blood stagnation. But if you have more like breast tenderness or uh, emotional mood swings, might be more like liver T stagnation. A lot of times people have both. And so that's why I like that formula. And um, it's just the, the original formula has GA gung in it as a guiding herb to the chest. So it's just that if I want to use this for um, more like uh, women's health and like menstruation issues, I would take out the GA gung because we don't necessarily want it to guide to the chest. And so that's a, a differentiation I would make. It also has like Nyo Shi in it, which has a very strong downward action. And so sometimes when I have people or patients that they have late menses, like they're, they felt like their period should have come a week ago and they've just been PMSing for two weeks and they have like, I, I need this period to come, then you can uh, emphasize or increase the dosage of some of the more blood invigorating herbs and especially the ones that move downward to kind of help the period come. So that's just a that's kind of a, a rambling explanation of why I like to use Shui Fuji Yutong. Yes, uh, okay, so you see, we're confirming Rogue Wei is in Shao Fu Ju Yutong. I always get that confused because I think I once had a patient and I like modified it to include Futsa, so I can never remember if Futsa is actually in the formula or if that's just a weird thing that I do. But um, yeah, I think Rogue Wei, Gan Jiang is definitely there, and Xiao Hui Shang is there. Boop, boop, ba -doo. What are some symptoms of cold in the liver channel? Um, so basically it's like we're going to see basically overall signs of cold. So we're going to see like <clears throat> a pale or blue tongue, a slow pulse, a cold body temperature, symptoms that are worse with cold. I think a lot of times the, there's something in the patient history that has to do with cold, that they have a lot of exposure to cold environment, or sometimes we see people that I think like one time we had a diver, someone who like worked on underwater ships, and so they were in the cold water a lot, and so that caused cold. So we have things like that. And then specifically cold in the liver channel, there's going to be other symptoms around the genitals. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's going to be other symptoms like that Shawn disorder, like hernia pain or a pulling sensation on the testicles or things like that. Cold is in the liver channel. Uh, how do we deal with interior cold? And so that's why our formula was like um, warm the liver decoction, non nuan gan tong. And so basically, remember in our um, warm the interior category, most of our herbs that warm the interior are like warming the spleen or warming the kidney. We do have a couple that warm the liver channel. So think like um, wu yao, wu ju yu. Xiao Hui Shang, herbs like that can warm the liver channel. I think we also use um, tangerine seed or tangerine flower, stuff like that. To move qi, if we were doing acupuncture, we'd probably use uh, some moxa as well. Remember, the little connecting point uh, is liver 5. Liver 5 goes up and encircles the genitals, so we might use that. I feel like we'd use liver five more for damp heat in the lower jowl, but we could also do some moxa on the liver channel to get uh, to get rid of cold. I feel like this is really rambling and incoherent. That's why I usually like when I do an actual video, I like to script it out first because otherwise we just kind of go all over the place. But that's good. People are asking good questions. Um, so yes, basically I would make sure that you consider these things that especially if you have a younger patient you might want to consider that it's more of an excess condition don't just immediately jump to kidney yang deficiency oh and say, oh you're here yeah I, I, I for some reason i thought it's like it's one in the morning where you are i can't remember uh but nte is asking what's the difference between invigorating blood and dispelling blood stasis um make that show up better. What's the difference between invigorating blood? And, uh, there's no difference. Uh, so, so basically it's like, it's just different terminology. Um, I'm going to say for all intents and purposes, there's no difference. If you want to dig into Nigel Weissman, he might say that there's a slight difference. Uh, basically, um, a lot of times I use the term blood stagnation 
And technically, that's not a correct translation, that when we say chi, we can have chi stagnation. With blood, we should say blood stasis. So a lot of times I say blood stagnation just because that's more familiar to, to people. But really, um, chi stagnation is chi zhi. Blood stasis is shui yi. We should be translating yi more as stasis. So I should say blood stasis instead of blood stagnation. And I think there's really not a whole lot of difference. Sometimes when you talk about blood stasis, when you get into the herbs, there are actually three levels of dealing with blood stasis. We can, I think, transform the blood, uh, quicken the blood, or break the blood. And this is just referring to how strongly they move the blood, that if we're just transforming the blood, we're kind of gently moving it along. When we're breaking the blood, that's more when we have like palpable masses due to blood stagnation and we're busting right through it. So to some extent, we could say there's a little bit of a difference there between quickening the blood versus breaking the blood. But clinically, those just, I'm going to say they say them, they mean the same thing. Ooh, this is a question that I was much debate. Um, is there such a thing as liver chi deficiency? So over my experience in highly regarded professor said yes. Um, I'm not sure. I would have to think about that because liver chi deficiency, because sometimes some of the ways I think about this is if, you, if we're going to say there's such a thing as liver chi deficiency, we would then have to ask, what are some points that tonify? Well, first we would ask, what are the symptoms of liver chi deficiency? And then when I'm thinking about most of the problems, usually when we think about liver deficiency, we think about liver yin deficiency or liver blood deficiency. If somebody said we had liver chi deficiency, I'm not entirely sure what, the, what signs and symptoms we would be looking for. Um, then our, the other thing I would look at is, if we're going to say there's such a thing as liver chi deficiency, it would be natural to ask, what are some points that tonify liver chi? And we can maybe say that liver three is the yuan source point, so it tonifies liver chi. But then also, what are some herbs that tonify liver chi? And when, when I think about it, I can't think of any herbs that have the action tonify liver chi. So I, so I would be curious about um, when your professor says there is such a thing as liver chi deficiency, what are the signs and symptoms of liver chi deficiency? And how would you, with herbs, how would you go about treating liver chi deficiency? Um, and sometimes those are interesting. So maybe maybe there is such a thing, but maybe it's just not something we talk about. Like when we talk about um, the pattern kidney chi deficiency, that's a very unusual pattern. So technically we can say, yes, there is something above there is such a thing as kidney chi. That kidney chi controls the transformation of water. Kidney chi controls the opening and closing of the gate at the urethra. So there is such a thing as kidney chi and kidney chi deficiency. However, some people will say that when we say kidney chi deficiency, we really just mean kidney yang deficiency. That kidney chi deficiency is kidney yang deficiency plus leakage. And so it's like technically there is such a thing as kidney chi, but what's we don't have a lot of herbs with the action tonify kidney chi. Usually if we diagnose someone with kidney chi deficiency, we end up using herbs that tonify kidney yang anyway. So, um, so that would be, yeah, here's someone saying, I saw liver chi deficiency come up in a book once, but didn't provide formula treatment. Yeah, so that's, that's what I would be interested in. So you're saying, mention apathy, there's no chi or emotions actually expressed, fatigue, but with no digestion or... Yeah, I could see that. I'm, I'm just wondering, it's... I'm also thinking about how to treat it. Or I guess maybe another example is Machiocha has this pattern. Uh, when you look at his Zong Fu patterns, he has a pattern that he calls spleen blood deficiency which is really weird because like, what is spleen blood? What does spleen blood do? What does spleen blood deficiency look like? And when you actually read his comment, when you read the, the text about it, he actually kind of admits that there's really no such thing as spleen blood. When we say spleen blood deficiency, what we really mean is the spleen is deficient 
and it's not producing blood. That because spleen chi is deficient, it can't transform the food. And so because the spleen is deficient, we end up with blood deficiency as a consequence. So it's not that the spleen blood is deficient, because there's no such thing as spleen blood. It's that spleen chi deficiency is leading to blood deficiency. So, so, so sometimes I wonder if we say liver chi deficiency, are we, do we mean something like that? That um, there's some other liver deficiency that's causing chi deficiency. But um, some of those like unexpressed emotions, I, I, I guess I tend to think that um, when you say the liver is yin in form and yang in function, I tend to think of uh, tonifying the liver, tonifying liver yin, tonifying liver blood so that it can perform its function of governing free coursing and moving the chi. So I think I I guess I think of the liver more like that. But the this liver chi deficiency, you all have to I'll have to look that up. Yeah, spleen yin deficiency. Uh yeah, that, that that's another one where it's like, is that is that a real thing? When people talk about yin fire and sometimes people use the term but they're they're meaning something very specific. Um So yeah, it's it's kind of like technically all the organs would have qi, blood, yin, and yang, but um, I'd be interested about what kind of patient we would actually diagnose with liver qi deficiency. Kind of like liver yang deficiency. Sometimes Japanese practitioners will say liver yang deficiency, but they really mean that's kind of they're kind of saying liver blood deficiency. So I'm I'd just be curious about that. Anyway, we're talking about erectile dysfunction. We got we kind of got into a, a liver discussion because we're talking about erectile dysfunction, and kind of the point of this that discussion was a lot of our erectile dysfunctions can actually, rather than coming from kidney yang deficiency or debility of the Ming Men fire, a lot of our erectile dysfunction uh, conditions can come from stagnation in the liver channel. That can mean liver chi stagnation. That can mean damp heat pouring into the liver channel. That can mean cold stagnation in the liver channel. Or that can mean blood stagnation. In the, I mean, the, the liver controls the free coursing, so that's also kind of associated with the liver channel. And so I think, especially like I was saying, especially if it's a younger patient, I would be more inclined to look at these liver things rather than automatically go to a deficiency pattern. But um, again, we can also mention that it's often a combination of a lot of these things too. That there can be a combination of excess and deficiency. So we might have to adjust our treatment strategy. So those are the excess conditions for deficiency. Um, heart spleen deficiency is an interesting one. And so this is a, a Gui Pitong type of pattern that it's usually, it might be a, an emotional cause if the person is worrying a lot, thinking a lot, overthinking, ruminating, that can cause spleen problems. Once the spleen craps out, it's no longer nourishing the heart and we end up with heart deficiency. And so the, the formula for this one is Gui Pitong, restore the spleen um, decoction. And remember, Gui Pitong is the one that we say, a lot of people say that's like the student formula. That um, because a lot of students, they're, they're spending time sitting, that sitting damages the spleen, that they're studying a lot, they're concentrating. Um, so overthinking or pensiveness can injure the spleen. And they have a lot of tests, so they worry a lot, that the emotion of worry can damage the spleen. And so then they start getting anxiety, they insomnia, and these heart conditions as a consequence. So it's the spleen is failing to nourish the heart, so you get this dual vacuity of the heart and spleen. And so that's why I call Gui Pitong. A lot of people say it's like the student formula. And so basically it's the same thing happening here that... Um, Demone, I think he mentions in here that this pattern is really common with people who think a lot, people like writers, professors, people who sit and are very pensive, and people who worry a lot. That, that emotional worry causes this pattern of uh, dual vacuity of the heart and spleen, and our formula there is Gui Pitong. Uh, then we have Ming Men debility forget how he words it, he doesn't say this, he says like the ability of the fire at the life gate or the life gate fire, but anyway, 
it's basically Ming Men fire, basically kidney yang deficiency. And so this this is what we what most people think of when they think of erectile dysfunction, that the kidneys govern the lower jowl, the kidneys uh, hold the essence, the kidneys govern reproductive things. So they when people see erectile dysfunction, they want to automatically go to the kidneys. And yes, that's possible, but I think it's good to look at these other ones too. Ming Men fire, I would say this is more. Um, something that's more likely to happen when you're dealing with an older patient. And so we, I want to make this clear dividing line, but I would say that if you're dealing with a man in his 60s who's having erectile dysfunction, probably more likely a, a kidney yang thing. If you're dealing with a man in his 20s with erectile dysfunction, maybe more of a liver chi stagnation thing. But we again look at the signs and symptoms. Ming Men Fire, our formula would be something like Yogwei Wan, uh, restore the right kidney. Maybe you could do a Shen Chi Wan or something, but I think it would be more like a Yog Wei Wan type of formula. I think this pattern is really interesting. Kidney yin deficiency with a fulgent fire. Uh, so basically when kidney yin gets deficient, um, uh, we tend to have a lot of heat signs, a lot of fire flaring up. And I feel like this is something that it's much more common to diagnose this pattern in women. Like this would be like a, a severe menopause type of condition that as kidney yin wanes, then we start getting like hot flashes, night sweats, things like that. That would be a, a kidney yin deficiency. Um, and, but it turns out we can also have this pattern in men as well. So, the, and so reading about this one, is kind of interesting in the book because um, usually heat and kidney yin deficiency is associated with like a high sex drive or um, hyper, hyper sex drive, hyperactive sexual activity or very high libido because basically that heat makes you all hot and bothered and, makes you, and gives you excessive libido. And so that's something that's associated with kidney yin deficiency. So basically we describe this pattern as the man has a very high libido. He wants to have sex all the time, but basically after sex is initiated, he can't maintain the erection. And so that's, that seems to be the common thing with this kidney yin deficiency with uh, fire. So, um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting distracted by questions. So uh, here our formula would be zhi bai di huang wan. That liu wei di huang wan is the one that tonifies the kidney when we add Jermu and Huang Bai, then it becomes Jer Bai Di Huang Wan, and we're kind of draining some of that fire. So, th so that's a really interesting pattern. I'm not sure I've actually seen that pattern very much. And then another interesting one, fear and fright damaging the heart and kidneys. So remember, we kind of differentiate between the emotions of fear and fright, but one of them affects the heart, one of them affects the kidneys. Here we're saying we have fear and fright damaging the heart and kidneys, and basically not... Um, causing erectile dysfunction. And so here we say this one is uh, most common in people that uh, basically like a PTSD sort of thing, if they've experienced some um, mental or emotional trauma, that an experience of fear or fright that can damage the heart and kidneys, that if they've experienced some, some violence or some abuse or something like that, that that fear and fright can affect the heart and kidneys. And one of the possible consequences is, would be erectile dysfunction. I want to say that um, one time when I was in school, we were going over case studies. And this was one of the case studies where it was like a man was having sex with his wife and the wife was unresponsive. And I think, I think she had just like fainted or something like that or she was really tired or something. But the man who was having sex, he thought his wife was dead. He thought he was having sex with his dead wife. Um, and it just caused such an emotional response, fear and fright that after that, he had these symptoms of erectile dysfunction. And so that's something that would um, um, it would be like fear and fright damaging the heart and kidneys. You know, saying excessive libido makes the kidney yin deficiency worse. Yeah, that's, that's like one of our causes of disease is sexual taxation, that like over or over sexual overactivity. So it's one of those things where it's like the heat can cause an increased libido, but then the increased sexual activity would make the situation worse. Does Jing essence come into play at any point? Um, 
I think that would come into play more with, when we're talking about fertility issues. I think just the act of um, getting an erection would be more like of a more of those other things that we're talking more about the flow of chi and blood to the penis or enough yang energy to uh, create an erection. So possibly in the sense that sometimes we have some connection between kidney yang and kidney essence. Like a lot of our herbs that tonify kidney yang also tonify kidney essence. So like if you were taking like lu rong, that would very strongly tonify kidney yang, but also tonify kidney essence. So they kind of go together. Um, but I think in terms of at least the patterns we have here, we don't really have specifically deficiency of kidney essence, deficiency of kidney jing, but I think that would definitely come up when you're talking about like fertility issues or things like that. Shui uh, ya, I don't know, I'd have to, extra points, I don't know, I'd have to look that up. Shui means blood, ya, dian I think just means, um, means like dot. So I'd have to look that up. I don't know my extra points very well. So those are so those would be our patterns, and so again, it's it's kind of like, like I said, I think it's it's really common that uh, people, when they see erectile dysfunction, they just automatically go to kidney yang deficiency. But we have to remember that there are these other possibilities as well, and I think that's also just kind of uh, in like common we could say like folk medicine in China, that it's people have like their home remedies, and most of those tend to be. Uh, doing something that tonifies kidney yang. So it's like there's a, a case study in here where a man had erectile dysfunction. And so talking to his friends and family, all his friends and family were recommending things like Korean red ginseng is an aphrodisiac or uh, horny goat weed. Yin yang huo is a kidney yang tonic that's famous for um, treating erectile dysfunction or using uh, strong warming agents like Lu Rong, those are the, the, the common go-to things. But I think especially if you're dealing with someone who's um, younger, if they have a lot of stress or things like that, it could be that you might be more likely to prescribe things like Chai Hu Shu Gan San. Oh, this is a good. A uh, young patient was having sex with his girlfriend or her family in the basement. And he got walked in on, and so that caused fear and fright. So um, it's kind of interesting when you say, because like, when we talk about the seven affects, we talk about fear and fright affecting the heart and kidneys. But there's also this idea. Um, there's another statement in the in the classics where it says fright is governed by the liver. So it's like if you get like suddenly startled and you tense up. Um, that can be called like liver fright because the liver governs the sinews or when you talk about childhood fright wind, it's um, fright can uh, affect the liver and actually stir up internal wind and cause like convulsions and things like that. So sometimes we talk about like, um, we also talk about the gallbladder in there, like heart and gallbladder deficiency. And so that's interesting. I would think that like being startled like that would also it would affect your heart and kidneys, but maybe also affect your liver as well. So that's interesting. Uh, Wuling San is interesting. So Wuling San, I think we usually talk about in terms of dampness. Let's see if we can, let's take a little detour. Did I just freeze? No, I'm still here. Do, 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 do. Whenever I want to look up formulas, we can just type in the name of the formula. Wuling San, and then type in American Dragon, because that's the best, uh, this is the best website. So if we want to look up the ingredients, we can go to herbs and actions. Zixie Fu Ling Ju Ling. So this is like draining dampness. Bai Ju, supporting the spleen. Gui Zhu, this is for a specific pattern. Sometimes we have an unresolved Tai Yang attack. So we'll use Gui Zhu to release the exterior. But more commonly, we also say that Gui Zhu has an action of lo uh, warming the lower jowl and disinhibiting urine. Um, yeah, here he said it warms the Ming men and assists the uh, bladder in transforming and discharging urine. So this is kind of interesting because normally you think of Wu Ling San as more like of a um, more like a something for dampness in the lower jaw. So that's that's kind of interesting that we should um, that we'd use a uh, Wu Ling San. Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't I didn't read it. Uh, uh, clearing. Uh, 
the clear it from the heart via urination. Yeah, again, we talk about heart is related to SI. SI is a tie on pair with UB, so we can kind of clear things from the heart. Guajer also affects the heart, so that's kind of a. Um, that's an, that's an interesting interesting way to do it. Uh, Bob Demone mentions the formula, but I had never heard of it. it has Ewanger in it. Let's see if we can look it up real quick. Because like I didn't remember it because it was a, a formula I'd never heard of for fear and fright damaging the kidneys. This pattern usually occurs in men who have a complete lack or partial lack of erection, who have a history of traumatic or fearful experiences, such as those encountered in combat or those who have been victims of violence, torture, or other forms of abuse. So, so that's that's what he's talking about. But I can imagine like being walked in on by your by a scary father would be another one. His guiding formula is modified Schwanger Tong mind diffusing decoction plus Yuanger Wan Yuanger pill. That seems like Shu Di, Bai, uh, Bai Ji Tian, Yi Zhe Ren, Wu Wei Zhe, Ren Chen, Dong Wei, Bai Du, Shan Yao, Fu Shen, Suan Zhao Ren, Yuan Zhe, Chai Hu Shang Ma is interesting, Shi Chang Fu. Um, so a lot of tonifying uh, herbs plus some stuff to uh, like anchor, settle calm, tonify. Tonify the heart. Oh, I just lost my page. So that's... Um, That's this one. Here, I'm gonna, this is an interesting question, so we're gonna take a little detour away from erectile dysfunction. Do you know anything about Bazi, a pairing who used to help patients based on the Wu Xing and other Taoist ideas? As far as I know, um, yeah, Wu Xing, but I, th I think Bazi is more like of a, like an astrology thing. So it's like making calculations based on uh, birth date and things like that, so constitutional things. Um, if you go to, do I have a button for the podcast? If you go to the podcast, look at the one with, uh, Lindsay, I always say her last name is Trottier, but it's actually Trottier. Um, go, go look at the one with Lindsay and she, she talks about Botza. Boop, 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 So if we go here, cancel. So the episodes, I think it's the second one, balance method. And so even though she, she's mostly talking about the balance method, we also talk about um, bots uh, making charts and things like that. So that's, it's kind of like we don't go into a lot of detail, but it is, uh, we do say something about that. So um, that's something that's, that's kind of all I know about it. So that's something you could look at for, um, about bots. Uh. Boop, 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 boop. Yeah, let's get rid of the... Um, yeah, and, and, uh, and so we're saying that this is like, I think some people use it more of like a feng shui, like astrology sort of thing, but then we can also use it in, in TCM terms. And I had a teacher who did a lot with, I think he called it like chrono acupuncture, that using not only using the the patient's date of birth and things like that, but also using the time and the season and the way the chi flows in the body at certain times that you can um, needle certain points based on that as well. Um, but yeah, so we, we talked about that a little bit, and I think she talked about it also uh, just in the context of it was something to do during pandemic when a lot of people were doing like phone consultations. This was something that she could do extra is make um these make the bots the charts for people and so doing their charting and that was kind of a way to um have have patients come to see her but she didn't necessarily have to stick needles in them so um it's kind of an interesting I, I don't know a whole lot about it but um that's something that she said she did so i think you can do extra trainings for that um so again that's erectile dysfunction Kind of what we were trying to say is uh, think about the liver channel. Don't just think about the kidney. Also think about the liver channel. Think about coursing things through the liver channel. And again, we had all those. We had all these things. Um, I'm not sure I've seen a lot of a lot of these that um, liver channel damp heat necessarily in men. I think when men come in with liver channel damp heat, it tends to be more of like. 
uh, a herpes condition, either HSV1, HSV2, or, or even herpes zoster, because the liver channel also goes to the, um, the rib sides. I'm not sure I've ever, so usually when I see liver, gallbladder, damp heat, it's usually something more like that, not necessarily erectile dysfunction as her chief complaint, but that's a possibility. Again, cold stagnation of the liver channel, I feel like the chief complaint would be more about um, Shawn disorder, hernia pain, something more likely like that. But I would say that um, liver chi stagnation is probably the main one to look at, especially if you have someone who's uh, really stressed or that um, emotions play in a role in it, or if it's someone that when they're by themselves, they have no problem with erectile dysfunction, but when they're with their partner, then they start to have issues. Then I would be more likely to diagnose liver chi stagnation versus um, a kidney deficiency. Whereas if we have someone who's um, older and have other signs of waning Ming Men fire, then we might go to kidney yang deficiency. So that was just mostly the point I wanted to make. Um, but you can go through this book um, and it, and it kind of goes through all these patterns. It's really interesting. He goes through some other things. I guess some other things we can talk about is do, do, do. he talks about some supplements and food therapy things. Talk about the different causes. We can also have neurological causes, things like that. That there's just that there's not nerve signals going to uh, the area. And so when he talks about Western complementary me uh, medicine, I think it's, he mentions yohimbe bark. And I think this is really interesting because I feel like yohimbe bark started off as, as something like this for uh, erectile dysfunction. Uh, it's actually a really good stimulant. So it's actually, I feel like now it's more, I'm kind of a bro. I go to the gym a lot. It's used as like a pre-workout stimulant. It's also a fat burner. Um, in order to work as a fat burner, you have to take it on an empty stomach, and I don't really recommend that. Um, so it's kind of so it's kind of interesting that it's something that it started out more as we have some research on yohimbe for erectile dysfunction, but now a lot of people use it for like fitness and as a stimulant. I would just say, if you're going to take yohimbe, be careful. Um, it's a stimulant. It um, it's a very good stimulant. Uh, basically, it's it's kind of like people would take it pre-workout, but I, I've like tried it and like, this makes my heart feel funny. It's kind of like when some people take um, allergy medications that have uh, ephedrine in them. They're like, ooh, I'm, I'm really amped up now. It's like, yeah, because you're like kind of taking a precursor to meth. Um, so I've had the same thing happen with Yohimbe, probably because I took it with caffeine, but it's like I took it, it's like, I didn't get an erection, but I was like, my heart feels funny now. So be careful with Yohimbe. If you're going to take it, start out small. I would say something that if you're going to take Yohimbe, this is definitely a consult your doctor first, especially if you have any heart issues or other, or if you're on any kind of drugs that this, this can be, it's not a gentle stimulant. It can actually give you a lot of anxiety and other problems. So I'd say be, be careful with the Yohimbe. He also mentioned some food therapy things at the end, and he has some case studies, which are kind of interesting. Boop, 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 boop. Oh, I thought he had a section on, maybe I skipped it. He, but he had a section on um, some food things. So one of the common ones would, would be walnut. Uh, he tao zhen is a very easy kidney yang tonic. I think he mentioned like shrimp. Shrimp is kind of an interesting one. Somebody told me that shrimp is really good for kidney yang because shrimp live in the cold water. So they have to be very young in order to balance out the cold water. So it's kind of like an opposite doctrine of signatures. So uh, shrimp and other things like that were mentioned. Eat a balanced, light, clear diet. Here we go. Don't eat hot, spicy food because it can damage yin. That's we say that about everything, not just erectile dysfunction. And this can consume a, a lot of hot, spicy foods can eventually consume kidney essence. And so that's something uh, we worry about for everything. So you want to use uh, eat foods that tonify kidney essence and enhance male sexual health. These include oysters, sea cucumber, abalone, shiitake mushroom, shrimp, scallops, walnuts, chestnuts, Chinese chives, venison, lamb, goat, and turtle. And so those would, those would be like some food therapy recommendations. I feel like the easiest ones. I'm not sure we have a lot of access to turtle or, go or even goat in America. I think it's hard to get goat. Lamb you can get, but it's kind of expensive. But again, lamb is really warming, so it's kind of the sort of thing. 
maybe eat those warming foods in the winter time, not necessarily in the summer. Otherwise, you can burn up your yin. Uh, but shrimp is a common one. Walnuts isn't a common one. Sometimes they'll say, like, eat a handful of walnuts every day is like a, a food therapy thing for male fertility or erectile dysfunction. There's something else I was going to mention here. When he talks about a case studies, Yeah, so we have a case study here where the patient was 31 years old, had experiencing yang wilt for three years. In, a, in an attempt to treat himself, at the advice of friends and family, he had taken many yang supplementing medicinals, including Ren Shen, Lu Rong, deer antler, without anything. And uh, anyway, it turned out that he, this, this particular patient, he'd been taking all these yang tonics, it actually started damaging his yin, that all these warm tonifying medicinals were burning up his yin. And so in the commentary about the, the case, Dr. Xiao emphatically stated that in his clinical experience, many blame yang wilt on yang deficiency and debilitation of life gate fire and are therefore eager to use warm supplementation to treat it. However, when treating yang wilt, do not be biased towards warm supplementation, but rather evenly supplement both yin and yang. So here he's saying there's this existing bias that whenever you see erectile dysfunction, you want to take warming yang tonifying herbs. He's saying don't necessarily do that. In this case, he had to tonify both yin and yang, but it could be that you need to actually create some movement as well, that you need to move liver chi as well. I think that's all I have to say about that. Oh, one more awkward thing. So also when we, when we see a patient and we're having this conversation, uh, sometimes one of the things I mention, especially if we're dealing with a younger patient and especially if we're dealing with that patient that they're able to get an erection when they're by themselves or spontaneously in the morning or when they're masturbating by themselves, totally fine to get an erection. But then when they get with a partner, they start to have problems. Either they can't achieve or maintain an erection or it's not sufficient to uh, have sexual activity. Sometimes when we get those people, we kind of have this have to have this awkward conversation about uh, masturbation and pornography. And I think that this is there's really nothing mentioned classically about this because this is one of those things that didn't exist in the time of Zhong Zhong Jing. I guess we can kind of talk about it because we say that sexual taxation can be an etiology of disease, and so it could be that we consider uh, pornography and masturbation could be uh, excessive sexual activity that could then deplete the kidney essence, blah, blah, blah. Um, but sometimes this is not really, there's not a lot of scientific evidence about this, a lot, not a lot of studies, but something I've just seen anecdotally that some people have experienced that when they reduce their amount of masturbation and pornography that helps with their erectile dysfunction with their partner. And I'm not sure there have been a lot of studies about this. This could just be that this is a anecdotal evidence from people on the internet. And so sometimes this is kind of a weird conversation to have with your patients, especially um, when I had like a, a female practitioner dealing with a male patient, it's kind of hard to bring up that subject. Like, so how much do you masturbate? Do you watch a lot of pornography? Maybe you shouldn't do that. It's kind of a weird thing to bring up. So sometimes the way I bring it up is I, I just kind of mention it in this way that, you know, when we're doing our treatment, this is what we're doing. We're, we're dealing with liver chi stagnation. So we're trying to increase circulation and that includes circulation to the penis so that we can have um, more, more flow of chi and blood to the penis to, to combat this erectile dysfunction. But then sometimes another thing we can think about in terms of lifestyle modifications is that sometimes we do see this association between masturbation and pornography use and erectile dysfunction. And so just anecdotally, this is something that some people have experienced when they reduce or cut out masturbation and pornography, they uh, get better performance when they're with their partner. And sometimes we can use this analogy that the same kind of thing happens to women it's like if a, if a woman is, whenever she masturbates, uses a, a like industrial strength vibrator, she basically gets um, accustomed to that very intense direct stimulation. And when they do that long enough, they're no longer able to get sufficient stimulation with their partner. And so it's kind of like they have to cut out 
the vibrator use in order to um, be able to have a satisfactory sex with their partner. And so the, the same thing can kind of happen to men. That's like if, uh, if three times a day you're watching pornography and you're using your kung fu grip, then you get accustomed to a certain type of stimulation and um, visual stimulation and physical stimulation. And then that can make it difficult when you're with a partner. So it could be that by abstaining from that stuff, that will improve um, your satisfaction with your partner. So that's kind of like a weird conversation to have, but you sometimes I frame it like that instead of being like, hey, how much do you masturbate? How much porn do you watch? Instead of doing that, maybe just saying, just mentioning that, oh, there is this association and it kind of makes sense. Maybe that's something you could try. So that's another, that's another thing I sometimes bring up with people, especially if we're dealing with um, a younger patient, that that might be a, a contributing factor. And again, I'm not sure there are a lot of studies for this. I'm not sure there's anything mentioned classically about this, but I think it's, it's kind of like with um, food that in modern times we have these hyper palatable foods that in the time of Zhong Zhong Jing, they didn't have... Uh, M&M's and Ben and Jerry's ice cream and they didn't have high fructose corn syrup. So it's kind of like because we have these hyper palatable overstimulating foods, we kind of have to consciously compensate for that in modern life. And I think the same thing happens with sexual stimulation that we have. Uh, we are exposed to hyper stimulating or hyper arousing sexual things and then that, that can actually interfere when you're trying to have a, a natural uh, thing. Does that book have any patterns on varicose? I'll have to look at that. It's been a while since I've read through all of this book. Benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostate cancer, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, priapism, hematospermia. Ooh, that doesn't sound good. Male infertility, andropause. I'm not sure. Um, I remember studying that. I don't really, I haven't like uh, treated that. So I'd have to look up to where to where to get that. What's the best way to reduce varicose? I don't know. It's, it's kind of like I don't want to give uh, specific uh, treatment things. That's kind of a same thing when somebody is talking about uh, lipoma. It's, I don't, don't want to give out specific medical advice that, that puts me in kind of a, a weird legal situation. I think I'm sorry to lose my voice. I think we'll call it there. I'm just seeing if there's any other uh, any other questions we should talk about. Oh, I think um, Natai did, uh, I don't know if you're still here, if you're still awake, uh, uh, sent a question about um, what do you do with needling when there are veins or where there are blood vessels in the way? Um, I think he specifically used the like pericardium six, it's really common to have a blood vessel in, in the way, or um, for me, more common, I'm not sure how, how good my vasculature is gonna show up. For me, it's more common, I have this big vein that goes right across my LI4, and it's kind of like, how do you, sorry, how do you needle uh, these points when there's a blood vessel in the way? So one, um, I would say I don't, I would say don't get too paranoid about it. That it's actually, I think it's very difficult to needle a blood vessel. Like if you think that when you're, um, when somebody is trying to draw blood, they actually, it's very difficult to stab the blood vessel. Like sometimes they have to try multiple times and they and they still don't get it. So it's actually to actual puncture a, a major blood vessel, I think is actually very difficult. When you're dealing with a little acupuncture needle that they're so thin and they're so flexible, it usually, it's difficult to puncture a blood vessel that usually either the needle will move out of the way or the blood vessel will move out of the way. So I wouldn't be too, too paranoid about it. That being said, don't, don't intentionally puncture, don't needle right over a blood vessel. So like with me and my LI4, it's like you can, you can kind of move it out of the way or just go around it. So sometimes you can just go around it. Sometimes if it's too much in the way, I just choose a different point. Sometimes I'll do it, it might be, I can do the point on one side, but not on the other side, so I just don't do the point. Or usually I'm not too married to one particular point, that's okay that I can just use a different point in my, in my point prescription. So usually it's not a big deal. Usually you can, you can kind of go around it, or you can just choose a different point. So 
I'm not sure that's very helpful. But I would generally say we don't have to. I mean, when you're when you're like when you're taking your board test, you need to know all the things about don't puncture the femoral artery and things like that. But I think honestly, it's it's not too likely that you'll puncture a blood vessel. I don't know. I say that, and one time I did. I needled a Li four on a woman, and she said her her hand like swelled up huge for a day afterwards, and then it went back down. And she showed me a picture, and I was like, "Oh my god, that looks terrible," and that was I must have hit some sort of blood vessel. So I I say that, and but like that's happened once. Um, more likely you're gonna. Uh, hit a capillary, and that's just the point might bleed. Like you might get a drop of blood when you draw the needle. That just means you hit a capillary. I think um, hitting a major blood vessel is not not very common. Same thing with like hitting a nerve and actually permanently damaging the nerve is not very common. You might hit a nerve and the person gets electricity, but you're not going to cause permanent nerve damage uh, with your acupuncture needles. I think the worst that can happen is you might irritate the nerve, and the people will patient might feel it for a day or two afterwards, but once that irritation goes away, it goes back to normal. It's very unlikely that you could actually permanently damage a nerve with acupuncture needles. I mean, still watch out for them. Still pay attention. I feel like I feel like I just opened my, myself up to a lawsuit. You should still pay attention to uh, proper precautions when needling. Boop, 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 boop. I think that's it. Um, let me know what you think about that. Um, if you like these topics or if we should just go to Q&A, we can think about what to do for next week. Come back here same time next week. As always, thank you to the Patreon members for your support. If you want to support the website, support the channel. There are some ways to do it down below. Oh, I will mention um, for the Patreon people, I've been working on a, a formula review course. So for the last couple of weeks, I did like a live stream sort of webinar for uh, reviewing all the formulas. And so that's still online on the Patreon. Um, but I've also been um, at this point going through and re-recording that and making them look a lot nicer. And so I'm eventually going to package that into an entire formula review course. But I'll be honest, it's taken me a long time to edit all of that. I'm only like halfway through the first chapter. So what I'm going to do is as I create these, we'll um, put them on the Patreon or on the other one. And so that's Oh, hey, I'm in the same room. I'm wearing a different shirt. Um, so that's going to be, uh, basically, I'm going to be putting these up um, as I get done with them. And so if you're on the Patreon, I'll be uh, posting these as I get them done. And then once they're all, once everything's completed, then we'll make it into a, a course and put it on Teachable with handouts and practice tests. But if you want to look at the, the works in progress as we go through it, um, I'll be posting on those on the Patreon, so that'll be like a special Patreon benefit, as you can see those things. So if you want to join that, that is, there's links to that in the description below. <sighs> I'm probably going to go to the gym because that's all I do with my life. It's sunny outside, we might go hiking. If you have any questions for next week, leave them in the comments below. And we can do, you can either do Q&A next week or we can try to find some topic to talk about. And... Yeah, saying needle in, in heart three uh, and causes hematoma. Yeah, that, that's really common. Usually if you like get a little bruise, that's just like you hit a capillary. It's not like you hit a major artery or anything like that. Um... I think that's all for now. Let me know if you have questions. We'll do this next week. I'm, I'm hunching over and getting tired. Hope you have a good weekend. We'll see you next time. Thanks again for being here. Uh, thanks for being here. Have a good weekend. We'll see you next time.